All right, we're on chapter 36 of the Copper Revolution, Healing with Minerals. Chapter 36, copper binds to and detoxes fluoride. So copper can be used to detox fluoride. Well, what, what, if, what if we should have more copper in our bodies than fluoride? At least twice as much or more. Why? Because the copper 2 fluoride molecule contains twice the weight of copper as fluoride. Most people, the average person, has 36 times more fluoride than copper. It's the other way around. So how much copper do we need to detox fluoride? If we assume all copper detoxes fluoride with perfect efficiency, we would need twice the amount of copper as fluoride in the body. The average body is 22,600 milligrams of fluoride and 72 milligrams of copper. So we would need 5,200 milligrams of copper. If we assume that we should be able to fix a deficiency within about three months, this implies we divide that amount by 90 days so 5,200 divided by 90 is 57 milligrams per day for 90 days. 57 milligrams of copper per day for 90 days. But nobody can start copper at 57 milligrams per day. Nausea sets in at about three to four milligrams. So it take, could take up to three months or maybe even a year just to work up to 60 milligrams per day. Is such a high amount of copper reasonable to supplement with? Well, the high iodine protocol is 50 milligrams of iodine per day, plus more in the form of potassium iodide. Uh, now, before I continue further here, maybe I mentioned it, but there's a problem, and that is we don't absorb all the copper we get. We only absorb 10% of it at high doses. So, you know, that should almost be multiplied by 10 to 50,000 milligrams. And maybe I go over that in the next few pages. I didn't. Oh, I lowballed it. So we really need a lot more. So it could take us maybe 10 times three months, really maybe about three years to detox fluoride. Wow. All right, well, let's just get back to the book. Um, so the high iodine protocol is 50 milligrams of iodine per day, plus more in the form of potassium iodide. Uh, vegans barely get one milligram of zinc per day. Uh, people can take up to 50 to 150 milligrams of zinc per day. Uh, people barely get 1 to 3 milligrams of boron per day. And people supplement up to 100 milligrams of boron. So it's not, so compared to those three other minerals, 50 milligrams a day of copper seems potentially very reasonable once you get past the scare tactics of copper toxicity. Uh, one man took 2,000 milligrams of copper per day. He didn't die, but he checked into a hospital because his red blood cells were getting destroyed faster than he could make them. He took 2,000 milligrams of copper a day for four months, or 120 days of that. Again, I don't recommend this. Uh, there was no liver damage, which is also very shocking, because we're always uh, taught, oh, copper liver damage, but he had no liver damage. So I would guess that his problem was that that much copper either blocked most of his iron or blocked vitamin C or a bit of both or caused other nutrient deficiencies. So 2,000 milligrams times 120 days is 2,000 240,000 milligrams. So compared to that toxic level of copper, what's 5,200 milligrams spread out over 90 days? Very, very little. So again, the lethal doses for copper start at about 10,000 milligrams and some say 20,000 milligrams in one day. Compared to that, again, what is 5,200 milligrams spread over 90 days? Very, very little. They say that at doses of up to 10 to 20 milligrams over 60 days, the body does not absorb the copper. It mostly excretes it. So here's where I get to that. Yes. Yes. Well, that's only 600 milligrams to 1,200 milligrams of copper. That's not nearly enough to detox a fluoride burden of 2,600 milligrams. So if we think about it, maybe the fluoride is copying, causing the copper to be excreted at 10 milligrams of copper per day levels over a short time frame. So maybe the body does not have this proposed homeostatic mechanism to excrete copper. Maybe it's just a symptom of fluoride detox. Again, show me the sample of Americans who were not toxic with fluoride. They don't exist. There are several further implications of this explanation. Some say that elemental copper is toxic because it's not bound by ceruloplasmin. But ceruloplasmin is merely a copper transport protein in the blood. And there are others, there's albumin, the point here is that elemental copper, if it binds to elemental fluoride and then is quickly excreted, it's neither poisonous nor is it not doing anything merely by being excreted. Excretion is good if it's carrying out toxins on the way. 
And maybe people say elemental copper is toxic as a hopeful mechanism to explain the mysterious and unexplainable copper toxicity idea of copper being toxic at low levels, even though, there's, even though there is no evidence of copper being toxic at low levels, nor any evidence of elemental copper being toxic. Some have said that since the body does not retain copper in these studies, it's evidence that the body does not want the copper and is evidence that copper is toxic. Neither conclusion is warranted in light of the body burden of fluoride if the fluoride is causing the body to excrete the copper. And then consider these other situations. Iodine is easily excreted. That's not evidence of toxicity. Vitamin C is easily excreted. That, that's not evidence of toxicity. B vitamins are easily excreted. That's not evidence of their toxicity. Boron is easily excreted. That's not evidence of toxicity. In contrast, toxic things stay in the body for a long, long time and are very difficult to remove. It's like this for lead, mercury. Uh, it's like this, yeah, for mercury, lead, aluminum, fluoride, and presumably other toxins. In fact, all the water-soluble vitamins and minerals I just listed are good detoxifying agents also because, again, they're easily excreted, and so they'll pull the toxins out with them as they go. The beginning stages of detox are nearly always uncomfortable. Detox symptoms might not be symptoms of copper toxicity, but rather indications that copper is binding to fluoride, moving it around and causing detox symptoms. Some detox symptoms might be skin rashes, as toxins sometimes try to come out through the skin. But as we have seen, copper is a historic remedy for skin rashes. Another detox symptom is nausea. It's said that copper causes nausea, but not always. People can build up a tolerance. How did a man consume 2,000 milligrams of copper per day without vomiting continuously? Note again, hey, this is dangerous, as he became anemic after four months. But the point is, he must have been building up a tolerance. Maybe the tolerance is simply having gotten past the worst part of fluoride detox. Fluoride also causes nausea in the stomach. Another detox symptom might be acne. Fluoride seems to come out in acne, and there is a book about this called Fluoride, The Hidden Cause of Acne. When going through fluoride detox, it is important to remember that copper is not toxic to the stomach. Copper strengthens the stomach. Copper heals stomach ulcers. Don't blame copper for the effects of fluoride. Fluoride is a nerve toxin. In contrast, copper helps make four neurotransmitters, assists in their reuptake, and is needed to make and restore the myelin sheath around the nerves. All those things speed up nerve transmission and boost coordination and intelligence. Fluoride causes joint damage. Copper is excellent for the joints. It helps make collagen and detoxes the fluoride. Uh, fluoride causes weak bones, and copper strengthens the bones, making collagen and putting uh, calcium directly into the bones. Fluoride lowers testosterone, copper boosts testosterone. So again, fluoride is the toxin, not copper. Thanks.